G'day folks, it's Rob here. And as promised, this week's video is going to be a bit of a Q&A session. I did ask in the last um, video if people had any questions I'd like to ask. And yeah, I've got a number from that clip and also there was a couple of good ones from the video beforehand um, from Hucho and also Tinderella. So thank you folks. So we'll look at those today. Uh, before we get cracking though, uh, just a quick heads up. I do have that aquaponics beginners guide available and you can also um, give it to your friends and family who are aqua curious as their uh, retrieve have actually made a little gifting um, box so you can actually send it off as a gift via uh, an email. So there will be an email, uh, an email uh, video coming out on that uh, probably later on tonight after you see this one. Um, so yeah, check that out if you want uh, full instructions on how to gift it, if you feel like giving the guide to a friend. Uh, also too, before we um, get into the video, I'd also like to thank all those folks who have been supporting us on our Patreon-like supporters page called Farm Your Own Yard. Thank you very much, folks. I wanted to get that out of the way first off, uh, primarily because there won't be another video before Christmas, I don't think, at this point in time. Uh, while we're thanking those folks, also thank you very much to the folks who do support us through our YouTube membership um, page or program. Thank you very much. Really do appreciate the support. I'll actually be hitting you guys up this week sometime to see if you want a, one more hangout before Christmas and we have a bit of a break until mid-January. But yeah, into the questions. Uh, first off, we have some from Tinderella. I've um, actually asked a number of questions. I'm not answering them all today, sorry. And I'm sort of going to be paraphrasing the, um, the questions. So the actual complete questions will pop up down the bottom if you want to read them. Uh, so first off the bat, uh, is there any reason you only ever have fish of all the same size in your tank? And can you not introduce fi uh, fingerlings um, with different maturity fish? and um, so you can have a continual supply of nitrite or sorry nitrate in the system hopefully no nitrate um, yes you can um, set it up so you can introduce uh, fish of different sizes into the system one thing you do need to um, keep in mind though um, as mentioned further on down in the um, question there are some species that will predate on smaller um, fish of their own variety such as trout and barramundi in particular uh, for, for you folks here in australia uh, Jade perch may do it, I'm not too sure. I do know that they will eat smaller fish, um, so I can't see why they wouldn't eat fingerlings if you introduce jade perch fingerlings. Uh, the main reason I don't do it is because we buy our fish in batches. So if I want a minimum order from most places is 25 fish, and once I get 25 fish in there, um, that's pretty much all going to see me through. When I harvest them, uh, do the final harvest, probably down to around about 10 fish, and then harvest those last 10 fish, there is a large bank of nutrients built up in the beds, so I don't really have to worry about getting fish in there straight away um, for, so the plants can be well fed. As long as I keep up the supplements, um, yeah, all should be fine because there'll be a load of nitrate in there. And then I can just add my fingerlings in, and then over time, as the feed increases, more um, nitrate will be added. There's no reason why you can't have two tanks in the system like our old system. I had two 1,000 litre or 260 gallon fish tanks. The idea was to rotate them as some were coming to maturity, have another batch in another tank, uh, but that, we just didn't get around to that. We ended up renovating the house and we ended up with the system we got at the moment for the time being. Um, another thing you can do is actually make a little basket that you can keep your fingerlings in within the same tank until they get large enough that the other fish won't predate on them and then add them into the tank. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, something to keep in mind though, when it comes to harvesting, if you want just the large fish out of there, it's going to be a bit of a challenge just to get a large fish out. Even from the existing 25 you may start off with without adding any in. Um, some will always grow faster than others. So it can be a bit of an issue. The only way I can really see around that is um, maybe having to um, drain down the water in the tank and then just trying to actively select one large fish at a time. Um, another idea might be, I've seen some people um, start to actually use a fishing line with a hook just to pull one fish out so you don't stress the other fish in the tank. And you'll generally find the larger fish will hit the feed first. So um, that might be something to consider. Not a method I've used myself, so yeah. Um, I hope that answers your question. On to Tinderella's next question. Why don't you have any deep water culture beds or floating raft beds for the leafy crops in particular? Uh, because they're short cycle and yeah, they 
generally do better in um, floating raft beds, uh, mainly because I've, I've got the media. Um, the media is in there. I could set up uh, raft beds if I wanted to. It's just that I find that media is a lot more versatile once I run a load of leafy. Sorry for that, just got a text message. Uh, once I run one load of leafy greens in there, I might want to plant out a tomato next. And while you can grow tomato in deep water culture beds, um, see Ryan Chatterson's farm for that. It's very hard to be able to suspend tomatoes the way I've got the system set up at the moment. If I was in a poly house, a, a greenhouse, hoop house, that may be different. But yeah, just for the time being, I'd rather stick with uh, the clay media. Um, depending on what happens with what I experiment with in the next couple of builds, I may add a raft bed into one of them. We'll just wait and see. Um, but yeah, I've got nothing against them. I just, you know, I just really like the idea of having media in the bed. On to the next one. Um, this one is a little bit longer. I'll try and paraphrase the best I can. Does all the years of experience you have growing give you much more respect for commercial farmers and growers uh, being able to churn out high volumes of blemish-free crops? Um, it seems like you get every single pest Im imaginable on different plants in the system um, and commercial growers manage to grow massive amounts and have them turn out, turn out absolutely perfectly. Um, yeah, I do know some commercial growers who grow in the ground and they use a load of pesticides or they have um, exclusion tunnels that they grow specific crops in. So it's one of those things, I don't use pesticides, I try to use, all well, the ones I do use are natural, organic, and generally targeted to one or two species. And because the system is exposed, as you would have seen in recent clips, every time it rains, a lot of those um, treatments get washed off. So you're basically back at square one, uh, rotating the spray over and over. A lot of those cabbages you see there, uh, they're pretty much all coming out this week because I can't keep on top of the aphids. They're getting down within the leaves of the cabbages. So we might as well just harvest them and have them a little bit smaller than we plan to. Um, no drama though, we're just gonna replace those crops with something like beetroot I think next because we're going through a load of beetroot at the moment, both the greens and the roots themselves. Um, so yeah, we might as well just um, cut our losses, plant something else in there and break the cycle of the pests. Keeping in mind, I'm not trying to grow the perfect veg. I'm into aquaponics for the fish because it's very hard to grow fish in the soil. I haven't seen anyone um, succeed in it yet. So um, that's my main focus at this point in time. And I know, you know, the plants will only just get better crop after crop after crop. So yeah, that's my take on that one as well. I think we'll leave it there, um, Tinderella. Otherwise, we're not going to get enough um, questions answered. We're already uh, close to the 10 minute mark from what I've recorded anyway. Uh, next we have Hucho um, from last, or well, the clip before last. Um, Hucho basically said, because um, I had a lot of rain issues at the time, I know rain dilutes his uh, hydroponic nutrients, which is annoying on the rare occasion we get it. Very true. Um, how, it, how does it affect your system? Well, basically with aquaponics, as long as we're not overflowing water from the system with a massive rain event, there really is no problem whatsoever. A couple of um, downpours we've had recently over the last couple of weeks, we have had water overflow from the system. Now, generally what that means is the nutrients will be lost as the water escapes. Uh, nitrate wise, not a problem in my system. Uh, nitrate is still pretty much well off the charts. I do have to keep an eye out though for other deficiencies, things like um, iron in particular and magnesium, uh, potassium if I had a lot of um, rooting and flowering crops in there, but I don't think it's a real issue at the moment. So it is something we need to keep an eye on. Um, the best way about it though is to keep a lot of freeboard in your sump tank. I always like to keep roughly around about 150 um, to 200 litres worth of freeboard in there. That's basically just free space, uh, free volume I should say in the sump. For any rain that comes to um, fill it up and I find through summer here I'm easily replacing 200 litres minimum a week uh, depending on what I have the beds planted out on so you know uh, one large rain event only takes two or three days to regain some of that freeboard again so not a huge issue um, so thanks Hucho by the way check out his channel links below and one will pop up there somewhere along the line so after another phone call, now on to real Max question. Hi James, by the way. Hey Rob, maybe you could give a before and after, after test results for the water that goes into the mineralization tanks. Paraphrasing again, the mineralization tank for you folks who aren't aware, it's uh, essentially a large compost brewer. What I do is I take the waste from the radial flow settler there, the fish solids, pop it offline in another drum, 
aerate it with a load of um, oxygen, hopefully, uh, from an air compressor, and they break down that organic matter into plant available, available elements. We then add that clear water after we let the solids settle out back into the aquaponic system, just trying to retain as many elements as we can from the fish waste to feed the plants. With the test equipment we have, we can do nitrate, uh, calcium and iron, I've got tests for those, but there's a load more elements the plants need, a whole massive list of them, and I can't test for them. So uh, what I am thinking about doing in the future is testing water straight from my system as it comes out of my um, moving bed bioreactor, forgot the name there for a second, um, send that water away to a lab to get tested for all the available, uh, available elements in it and then also test a clear sample of um, water from the mineralization tank. Essentially, it's gonna have the same water in it. It's just going to be a lot more concentrated with the elements from the mineralizer. So yeah, it'll be interesting to do a bit of a comparison. The reason I haven't done it at the moment is twofold. Um, one, money. Um, they're a little bit expensive here in Australia to do those tests. And secondly, I'd like to get a decent load of solids through the system or through the mineralizer, um, let it build up a little bit of a nutrient bank, if you will, and then do the test there because through winter, the fish really haven't been feeding a lot. At the moment, they're really smashing through the feed. Um, but yeah, I think I would like to wait a little while before I do that test. And yeah, it will be coming to the channel. So if you're not subscribed and you do want to see that video once it occurs, or gets posted, I should say, um, hit that little subscribe button down there and then jump on over to the bell icon. So YouTube will send you a notification when any aquaponic clips get posted to the channel. So that's enough of page one, on to page two. Uh, Troy, Rob, do you think we really need a biofilter if we're using media grow beds as the filter itself to colonize the good bacteria? Basically what um, Troy is talking about is this moving bed bioreactor I have here. Um, I personally think it is a good idea to have one in the system if you are running your water from the fish tank through a solids um, settling device, then a biofilter, then in the sump tank with some of that water going directly back to the fish tank. I know some people say you can get away with it. I'm, hundreds if not thousands of people, actually it would be thousands of people, already do get away with not having anything like this in the system but I do like to have it there. Um, there's two reasons why. Firstly, I did notice that I was getting ammonia and nitrite going back into the fish tank um, at the start of it, uh, once it first started out. Basically, not enough biological surface area in the sump tank down there to process the ammonia all the way through, so some was going back into the fish tank. If you're just new to aquaponics, there's a load of clips in this play playlist with a um, one on cycling the system in there, so just suss that out if you're a bit confused about what I'm talking about. Um, so, but basically we don't want nitrite and ammonia going back into the fish tank. Um, there are ways you can safeguard your fish, but too much to go into here. So that's why I prefer to have it in the system here, even though I've got more than enough media to process the ammonia from the fish. Uh, the second reason I like to have it there is because if anything goes pear-shaped with the system, or maybe when it comes time for us to move the grow beds down the back, I can leave the fish up here and just have the water running through um, the filtration, through the biofilter, into the sump, and then have water going directly back into the fish tank and run it as an aquaculture system because I have more than enough biological surface area in here to look after processing any of the ammonia waste that the fish can produce. Um, that also comes in handy, you say, if you're totally smashed by a pest that you can't get under control and you need to spray the system. You can isolate the grow beds and just run it basically as an aquaculture system because you've got this little biofilter here. So it's something I like to keep in my systems and I'd recommend people who are really dedicated and want to set up a decent system for a number of years that they also look into doing something like this. It really is just one of those little extra safeguards that I like to recommend. But in saying that also too, if I had the system set up differently, if I had the water going from the radial flow settler, directly into the grow beds themselves, and then from the grow beds back to the sump tank, and then back to the fish tank in one single loop. I wouldn't need this whatsoever, but like I said, I do like that added safety of being able to separate the plant from the fish side, and it'll definitely come in handy when I move the system in a couple of months time, or hopefully a month's time. So I hope that answers your question, Troy. Now on to Lewis. Lewis has asked, everything looks great. Do you have a separate tank where you collect rainwater and treat that before adding it to the tank? Uh, what would be required prior to adding it in? Um, no, we don't have rainwater tanks off uh, the house here. It's something we planned on. Basically, we ran out of coin and we haven't gotten around to doing it. Um, so 
If we were to have rainwater tanks here though, I would still run them through a basic filter system because we live in the city, a lot of pollutants fall on the roof, um, they would be collected and uh, basically um, deposited in the rainwater tank and a lot of them would settle out on the base and I would definitely want to treat that water through some sort of filtration system before it goes into the system. Um, I probably would have another issue as well and that is um, continually falling pH because the rainwater here um, is on the acidic side, definitely below 7. So I would have to um, add some minerals into the system, some carbonates to try and raise the alkalinity which would help keep the pH up and the fish happy. So um, that is something I would have to do with the, um, the rainwater. So so I hope that helps you there, Lewis. Now on to David. Thanks for the update, Rob. I've moved recently and about to set up my aquaponic system again. Congrats, mate. Um, what downsides do you see in using 20 millimeter or three quarter inch river pebbles as a medium in a flood and drain grow bed? Um, I really see no problem with using them whatsoever. They have more than enough surface area, pretty much all comparable with the clay that we use here. They're a lot cheaper if you're running on a tight budget or maybe you live on a property where there are river rocks available that you can use. Uh, one thing I would do though is just give them a quick carbonate test to see if there's any carbonates in there. Basically pop the rocks in a jar, pour pure white vinegar, just cooking vinegar will do, over the top of it. Uh, it doesn't have to be pure full strength. And if you see a stream of little bubbles coming through, You'll know there's some carbonates in there and yeah i wouldn't use that in the system but if it comes up uh, the test comes up bubble free yeah you should be right to go and using that uh, the only downside i really see in them is well, actually two um, if you're trying to work through the media and clean it out it can be rather uh, hard on the hands uh, moving the media around when it comes time to clean the beds and the second thing is i've seen people set up systems using rock uh, just on the lawn and the grow beds tend to sink over time into the soil itself so uh, if you are going to set it up somewhere on the soil make sure you've got some maybe um, full length sleepers under all lengths of the grow bed just to distribute the weight evenly a little bit more and that it should help it stay above the surface but yeah as a, as a medium i see no problem with them whatsoever uh, now the next one is not so much a question it's more a comment i've got about the sweet potato over in the system so we'll take the uh, camera over there and we'll have a bit of a gander so you may remember from the last video um, i had a mass of sweet potato vine just growing out of the corner of the grow bed here well that is something that has since been rectified i've given the uh, plant a massive haircut and thrown all the runners down the back and what i'm going to do is do something that has been suggested by a few people now and that is burying if i can just set this camera up um, burying a load of or oh, a couple of these runners underneath the clay um, there is a video by matt g'day matt if you're watching um, where he basically found that by burying these runners themselves under the clay um, and with the wet media or well, down in the wet zone of the media that he had roots going down into the grow beds and those roots ended up forming little sweet potatoes so i thought i'd give it a crack um, as I've mentioned, I have grown sweet potato in the aquaponics before previously, and I didn't have much luck with any rhizome in the beds themselves. We had a couple of small ones, but nothing too massive. So I don't think these are going to sit down too well. Get a little bit forceful here. Um, might have to actually peg them down, I think. Um, but hopefully the plan is that these guys will send roots down from these little leaf sections here, these little leaf junctions, and set some sweet potatoes themselves. And hopefully, I can get it down deep enough. And it's gonna stay under the clay there. And there is another one, just a very small one on this side over here. Uh, by the way, these chives are all still aphid free, just to let you know. Uh, this one here, same thing, just push it right down. And I will come back and continue to push these tips under as well. And I will definitely keep you all updated in future videos on how these go. So that's the start of it, I suppose. And as you can see, the, the water does come up to like within an inch or 25 millimetres from the top of the bed here. And the plan is that um, these uh, white beetroot over on this side here, they will be coming out soon. And I'm thinking I might just let these sweet potatoes take over this whole top of the bed 
just as a bit of an experiment to see how they go. Just before I toss some food in for the fish, oh, we might as well do it now, hope I don't get splashed. Um, I would like to wish you all a very happy and merry Christmas holidays, however you like to celebrate this time of year. Uh, I hope you get to spend some time with some family, friends and loved ones. Um, we'll be spending it with family pretty much all this year, I think. Um, once again, I would like to thank you all for coming along and checking out these videos all year long. Uh, next year, 2022, we'll have a lot more content looking at aquaponic system design and building and running systems. And there'll also be a couple more guides in the works as well. So yeah, don't forget, check out my guides if you want to support the channel and also our Farm Your Own Yard page. I really would appreciate that. Uh, but I will pretty much will leave it there. I do hope you're all well and happy and your gardens are booming and I will catch you next video, next year maybe. Cheers folks and happy growing.